Did you know that Japanese is the only major language that left us no clues as to where it actually came from? So what is the deal with Japanese? Well, today we're going to dig deep and find out what makes the Japanese language so unique and so interesting. And make sure you stay to the end if you want to learn to actually speak Japanese, because I'm going to be uncovering that particular mystery too. え、で、その中で経験したことなんですけれども、日本語の素晴らしいところっていうのはやっぱり若にも見られるような多彩な表現力と、え、奥ゆかしい感情表現などにあると思います。Nice message there. So Japanese is one of those languages that you don't really hear too much on streets around the world, in most places anyway. And even though it has more than 128 million speakers, Japanese is mostly spoken in the Japanese archipelago itself, plus a few immigrant communities nearby. Of course, there are Japanese immigrants and their descendants living abroad. About 1.5 million of them, in fact, are mostly in North and South America. So if you were wondering, how to learn Japanese and stay motivated without moving to Japan, well, you're in luck. By the way, if you're new here, my name is Ollie Richards, and this channel is all about helping you learn a new language quickly using the power of story, so you can become fluent faster and live your best life. Now, what do we know for sure about the origins of Japanese? Well, the earliest people living in Japan were hunter-gatherers called the Jormon, and this was around 12,000 BC. And obviously, we don't know what language they spoke. Most of what we know is guesswork, but there's evidence of many different tribes and migrations going on. Most linguists and archaeologists agree that the Japonic language family was introduced to Japan a little later, when the Yayoi people came across from Korea, which was about two to three thousand years ago, and started farming and mixing with the Jormon. Within Japan, there are some other beliefs, some other ideas, like perhaps the tribes who came from Korea were not actually Korean, but just horse riding nomads just passing through Korea. Who knows? Either way, today's Japanese only have a small amount of the original Jormon in them, and they are predominantly descendants of the Yayoi people. Now, does this make the Japanese language a cousin of Korean? Well, not really. The pronunciation of Japanese is quite different to Korean, and they are not mutually intelligible. Here's some Korean for you to listen to. 안녕하세요. 저는 한국 사람이고, 저의 이름은 배수성입니다. 어, 현재 대한민국 서울에 살고 있고, but the two languages do share some significant key features, like the basic structure of the language, vowel harmony, a lack of conjunctions, and one particularly fascinating feature, honorifics. Yeah, you might have heard about this. An honorific title is a little suffix that goes after a person's name, and the particular title that you use depends on how much politeness that you want to or have to show that person. Now, Japanese and Korean and Javanese as well, they're, they're big on honorifics, and it's really, really interesting. Here are a few examples. You have chan. Now, this adds a sense of cuteness. You can add it onto a name, a little bit like this. So you'd use this one on you know, young people, close friends, babies, cute animals, things like that. Next, you have san. Now, san is the most common, and you can use this in most situations just to show basic respect to somebody. You have senpai. Now, senpai is what you would call people who are older than you. And then there's another one that you probably know from martial arts, sensei. Now, sensei is for people who have a high level of mastery in something, or who are teaching you or helping you with something. Now, if you want to reach a high level of mastery in Japanese, then like and subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications too so that you get all the best tips. Now, while some people think that Japanese and Korean have the same roots, it is a sketchy theory, to be honest, because most modern Japanese is not related to any other language. You can look out for a future video where I'm going to explore the differences between Japanese and Korean in some more detail. So Japanese belongs to the Japonic family, which also includes the endangered languages of Ryukyuan, spoken in the Okinawa and Amami Islands. And the Okinawa language is vastly different to standard Japanese, although it isn't actually recognized as a separate language in Japan. And because of government pressure to assimilate, most of these people now speak with an Okinawa Japanese dialect rather than their original language. But they have some very, very cool folk music down there. Japanese is also a recognized language in Palau, but even with 
Within Japan, there are many different dialects. You have uh, Hiroshima, Nagoya, and the dialect many Japanese people find amusing, which is Kansai. Now, as we saw with Papua New Guinea in a recent video, very mountainous islands have natural barriers, physical barriers, so language varieties don't always mix that well. And that's the case here. So in a nutshell, there are two major Japanese varieties. You've got the Tokyo type and the Kyoto Osaka type. It's basically a north-south division. Interestingly, some of the remote mountain villages and isolated islands still speak dialects from old Japanese. It's pretty cool if you get a chance to spend time in these places. In fact, the peripheral regions have varieties of Japanese that can actually be incomprehensible to speakers from different parts of the country. The difference is there, they're mostly to do with vocabulary, pitch accents and inflections. But don't worry, as a learner, you will always learn and be taught standard Japanese. It's just interesting to know what else is out there, especially if you're thinking about doing some kind of immersion in a more rural part of Japan. So for example, you probably want to avoid spending time with the next variety until you've reached a confident level in your Japanese. Miyako is spoken primarily in the Miyako Islands. But what if you want to learn Japanese outside Japan? Well, let's see how the language has traveled over the years. The biggest spread of Japanese to the rest of the world happened in the Meiji period from 1868 to 1912, when a lot of Japanese emigrated to the Philippines and to the Americas. This is their 15-year-old emperor. Now, this is known as the Japanese golden era, and I have an amazing story about that later. Any guesses where you'll find the most ethnic Japanese people today around the world? Well, it's in Brazil, mainly in Sao Paulo. Now, the first Japanese immigrants came to Brazil on this ship in 1908, and Japan actually had posters up encouraging people to go. These immigrant descendants are called Nikkei, and even though the younger generation speak mostly Portuguese as their mother tongue, a big mix of Japanese dialects are also spoken. If you want to do some immersion, some Japanese immersion in Brazil, one place that you could hunt out is the town of Liberdade. There are lots of options there. You can chat with Japanese speakers at the many food markets or hang out at the cool karaoke bars there. Singing Japanese karaoke is a very fun way to practice your Japanese language skills, by the way. Then there's America, and you can hear authentic Japanese here too, especially in Hawaii, because that's where most of the Japanese immigrants settled. Even today, a lot of people in Hawaii speak at least a little Japanese, so it won't be hard to find people to talk to. But you know what? Even if you are not ready to travel, you can still learn Japanese in an immersive way. There are programs like Japanese Uncovered, which is a really effective self-study course that I have based on stories, which you can do from anywhere, from Hawaii, Brazil, wherever you are. I'll put a link to that in the description in case you're interested. But let's talk about the big fear that comes with Japanese, which is often Japanese writing. Now, I won't lie, Japanese has a complicated writing system. You have to learn katakana, hiragana, and kanji. Yeah, that's not one, but three writing systems. And one of the hardest parts of learning Japanese is getting your head around that. And yet, thousands of people around the world are determined to do this. And for one possible explanation, you could look at this. People are pretty obsessed with anime, but there is a whole world of Japanese culture and media to explore, and not everything is translated into English. So why three writing systems? Well, ancient Japanese had no written language. During the 5th and 6th centuries, Chinese was introduced to Japan and the Japanese tried to, they tried out their first writing in Chinese. But then they tried to write Japanese with Chinese characters and things got a little bit more complicated because Chinese and Japanese, of course, are different languages with different grammar. Kanji didn't work for a lot of the Japanese grammatical bits. So the first solution was manyogana. This is using Chinese characters for their sounds not for their meanings. But this caused even more confusion and was really hard to read and write quickly. Let's just say the Japanese had no time for such complications. And so some monks simplified the Chinese characters and katakana was born. They still used kanji, but they added katakana to fill in the gaps. Japanese women were forbidden to write kanji at the time, but they wanted 
to write. Good on them. So they developed their own writing system called hiragana. Now, hiragana has the same sounds and number of letters as katakana, but it's got more round, curvy strokes. So why must you learn all three? Well, in short, it's because each script has its own specific role, and they all kind of work together in a very interesting way. Hiragana is the basic Japanese alphabet. This is the one that kids learn when they first go to school. It represents all the sounds in the Japanese language and is used to spell words that are native to Japanese, like sakura or cherry blossom. Hiragana is also used for grammatical particles and word endings. So think of hiragana as the kind of glue of the sentence that binds everything together. Kanji then is the Chinese characters, borrowed from China, and the script here is used mostly for nouns. Verbs and adjectives are written with combinations then of kanji and hiragana together. And then lastly, you have katakana, and the letters from katakana match hiragana like for like, one for one. But they're only used typically for words borrowed from foreign languages, words like beer or taxi. Now, if you love manga, that's good. It's full of katakana, and you would have seen it before. It's mostly to show that someone has a foreign accent when they're speaking, or for some kind of strange sound effects, which can be pretty cool. Are you with me so far? If you are, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Turn on notifications too, so you get more videos like this. Look, the phonetic systems of katakana and hiragana are actually quite simple. The tricky bit in Japanese is the kanji. And if you have heard, perhaps, that there are 50,000 of them, don't panic, you only need around 2,000 of the main ones. And so to answer the obvious question, Yes, one Japanese sentence, one single Japanese sentence can use all three writing systems together at the same time. Have a look at this sentence on the screen now for an example of this. So you can, in Japanese, write everything in hiragana if you want to, but believe it or not, learning kanji, it actually makes sentences easier to read. And this is partly because Japanese doesn't have any spaces between words, and so kanji visually helps to break up the sentence. But if you're curious about the features of Japanese and you want to learn a, bit, a little bit more about this, and you can get a much more detailed explanation on my blog post that I have right here. Now, as for Japanese vocabulary, well, it's a combination of Chinese-derived words, Japanese native words, and foreign loan words, uh, a little bit like these ones here. There is a story that I'm about to tell you about the Japanese Golden Age, and here is a clue. The first novel in the world was written during this time. The first novel ever. I'm talking about the years between 794 and 1185, and it was a high point in Japanese culture. They called this the Heian era, and it was an amazing time when Japanese arts and literature flourished. It was a golden age of peace and harmony. And a person who knew how to write good poetry in that time was highly regarded, and they even had poetry parties to test people's wits, and, and if you messed up, you would everyone would just laugh you under the table. It was a serious business. In fact, even writing poor calligraphy could ruin your entire reputation. But it gets more interesting. So do you remember I told you that women were banned from actually using Chinese characters? Well, to get their own back, they got smart with a particular Japanese vernacular, writing about their daily lives in diaries, poems, and letters. And that is one of the major reasons that we actually know what life was like for them at that time. But the juiciest part is that one of these women, who was banned from writing in kanji, wrote the world's first novel, and it was called The Tale of Genji. It's about the life and romances of a prince. It's 1,300 pages long, and it was so incredible that the men had to start to take it seriously. Now, how is that for a cool linguistic story? But look, if you want to learn to speak Japanese, then there's absolutely one story that you really need to check out, and it's in this video over here. It's the story of how one teenager learned to speak flawless Japanese while living at home in the US. It's a hard-hitting story, but it's really inspirational, and if you have any desire to learn to speak Japanese, you should check this out right now. 